Hello everyone, welcome back. This is Easy Learn AI. We learned about the shortcomings of the step function and the concepts and features of the sigmoid function in the previous video. In this video, we will explore the limitations of the sigmoid function and introduce other activation functions that overcome its weaknesses. Chapter 1 Weaknesses of the Sigmoid Function The sigmoid function is undoubtedly an improved activation function compared to the step function, but it has its own weaknesses. The most important weakness is that the gradients at both ends approach zero. Why is it a problem that the gradients approach zero at both ends? It's because even when there is a large difference in input values, the difference in output values is minimal. This problem is quite similar to the one we saw with the step function. In the step function, whether the input was 0.499 or 0.001, the output was always zero. The issue with the step function is that it doesn't effectively reflect the differences in input values in its output. Unfortunately, this issue reoccurs at the extremes of the sigmoid function. Let's consider a deep neural network with multiple layers. The input to an upper node is the sum of the outputs of many lower nodes. However, the sigmoid function's outputs are always positive. If we assume that the weights of the connections, synapses, are also positive values between 0 and 1, then the input to the upper node will also be positive. As we move up the layers, the inputs tend to become larger. When inputs become large, the corresponding gradients become close to zero. In later videos, we will delve deeper into this concept, but when gradients become zero, it means that the learning effect of backpropagation is also close to zero. This phenomenon, where the efficiency of learning decreases as the neural network becomes deeper, is known as the sigmoid saturate and killing gradients problem, and is a fundamental reason for the vanishing gradient problem, which we will cover in later videos. The second weakness is that the sigmoid function always outputs positive values. This is known as the non-zero centered problem. Why is this an issue? To illustrate this, let's revisit the learning process of a perceptron from a previous lecture. Here, the learning method for the perceptron was as follows, certainly, the learning process of a multilayer neural network is much more complex than that of a perceptron, but conceptually, we can still consider that changes in synaptic weights are proportional to the input values, or input values gradients, and the error. So, let's consider a simple neural network, the input becomes positive due to the sigmoid function. If the output error is negative, the current input and the product of the error will cause the signs of changes in both connection weights to become simultaneously negative. If the error in the output becomes positive, the signs of changes in both connection weights will simultaneously become positive. The statement that the signs of changes in both connection weights are simultaneously the same means that in this W1, W2 plane, new W1 and W2 can only move to these regions. This is because, in this W1, W2 plane, if both changes are positive, the new connection weights W1' prime and W2' prime will be in the following position. Similarly, if both changes are negative, the new connection weights W1' prime and W2' prime will be in the following position. So, let's reconsider this W1. W2 space. If the initial connection weight values are as follows and the optimal connection weights to be reached through learning are as follows, it would be great if W1 and W2 values could change progressively upwards as shown below. However, there are constraints on the changes in W1 and W2 during the learning process. So, new W1 and W2 are updated like this, and here, the next possible region for W1, W2 is in the purple area, in other words, the first and third quadrants. Therefore, new W1 and W2 can be updated as shown below. From here, new W1 and W2 can come out again in the first and third quadrants, 
resulting in a zigzag pattern in the learning process. The zigzag pattern ultimately indicates a decrease in the efficiency of the learning process. In other words, sigmoid-based learning sometimes exhibits such inefficient characteristics. Chapter 2, Beyond the Weaknesses of Sigmoid The zigzag phenomenon observed in the sigmoid function was due to the fact that the output values of the activation function are always positive. So, while hyperbolic tangent function looks similar to the sigmoid function, it has output values in the range of minus 1 to 1 making it a good alternative to the sigmoid function. The hyperbolic tangent function retains the advantages of the sigmoid function, while addressing the drawback of the sigmoid function, which is the non-zero-centered problem. However, the hyperbolic tangent function still cannot fully address the gradient killing and saturation issue. So, to address this gradient killing and saturation problem, a new type of activation function has emerged which is the famous RELU, Rectified Linear Unit, function. The RELU, Rectified Linear Unit, function, which is a relatively recent addition, is considered a significant innovation in today's deep learning due to its ability to solve the persistent problem of vanishing gradients that was a challenge with sigmoid and hyperbolic tangent functions. As you can see, the gradient of the function is always fixed at 1, 4 positive values, which eliminates the problem of vanishing gradients. This allows for deep learning with error backpropagation to work effectively, even for deep layers in neural networks. However, the RELA function also has a drawback. As you may already know, when the input is negative, the gradient becomes zero, causing a problem known as the dying RELU phenomenon, where the neural network stops learning due to a gradient of zero. To address this issue, variations of RELU have been introduced. It introduces a small slope for negative input values, allowing neural network units to continue learning even when the inputs are negative. Another variation is the parametric rectified linear unit activation function. PURELU introduces a parameter A instead of a fixed slope like leaky RELU 0.01. This parameter A can be learned during training, allowing the model to adapt and set its own slope, potentially increasing training efficiency. Another alternative is the exponential linear unit, ELU, activation function. ELU uses an exponential function with a curved shape for negative input values. It is said to provide faster and more accurate learning compared to some other activation functions. In conclusion, activation functions can be broadly categorized into the sigmoid family and the RELA family. The variety of activation functions reflects the diversity of neural network models and the types of data they are trained on. It's also important to note that there is no one-size-fits-all perfect activation function. Therefore, it's crucial to choose the appropriate activation function based on the specific characteristics of your problem and data. In the next video, we will delve into the concept of gradient descent, which was briefly introduced in this video. Gradient descent is an incredibly important concept in neural network learning, so I highly recommend watching it. We appreciate your engagement and look forward to exploring further with you in the next session. Until then, farewell. Your interest and love for this channel help a lot in preparing these lectures so please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button.